What's going on guys? Welcome to NetSec Explain. This is part two in our SQL injection series. In this video, we have some fantastic demos, so make sure you watch until the end. If you haven't already checked out our part one, where we went over the SQL basics, I suggest you check that out first. But if you're already good to go, then let's go ahead and jump right in. So real briefly, what is SQL injection? Well, SQL injection happens when user input can be injected into database queries. As a result, attackers can retrieve all sorts of juicy information from the database. In fact, many of the world's most high profile data breaches were the result of SQL injection attacks. In this video, I'm gonna show you the most straightforward types of SQL injections and two websites where you can practice them on your own. So let's get started. Okay, so the first website we're going to use is the Portswigger Web Security Academy. They have a ton of great challenges, especially if you're interested in bug bounty, pen testing, or general web security. Let's go ahead and skip a few of the beginner challenges, and we're going to take a look at the SQL injection union attack retrieving data from other tables. And I'm going to go ahead and access the lab. So this is gonna spin up a lab instance for us to play around with and take a look at. Awesome. So this is our demo website. Uh, we can see that we have a homepage. Uh, we also have a My Account page. And here it looks like it wants us to log in. So we don't have any credentials for that yet. So let's jump back to the homepage. And the last little thing to take a look at is these categories. So these look like different advertisements for various products. Uh, we can sort by gifts. Uh, we can sort by pets and a few other different categories. So it's probably at this point where you're wondering where to even look for SQL injectable endpoints. Well, that's pretty easy. Anywhere that the application is making a query to the backend database. In fact, the most common locations are login or authentication pages, search parameters, and data lookup tables like users table or product pages. In this case, it's going to be in the product filter parameters. So looking at the way that the application works, we want to get an idea of what the source code is probably doing on the back end. We can see that it's returning at least a title and product details based on some category filter. So let's take a look at this in VS Code. Here I have just a simple demo uh, where we have a query that looks plausible. Uh, so we have select title and details from products where category is category. So if the category is our injectable endpoint, then how can we actually manipulate this in order to cause some sort of difference in the SQL query of the data that it returns. Well, let's take a look at it this way. So I'm gonna highlight this category. We can see our injection endpoint. And in VS Code, you can press Control D to highlight all instances of the highlighted areas. So in this case, I've highlighted category. So I can type in toys and I can type in pets and we can see how it affects the query parameter. Cool. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. So if I start with something like pets, and then I put a single apostrophe, and then I can type in something like or one equals one, we can see how the or in our user input is actually interpreted as part of the query itself and not part of the string in categories. So this is how we break out of the injectable parameter and we can enter in our own queries. So you'll also notice at the end, we have an apostrophe and a semicolon just kind of trailing out there. We don't want that. This is a bad query and it can cause a bunch of errors. So instead, what we're going to do is comment out the rest of this. So I'm going to type in a uh, semicolon and then I can do a comment character. Depending on the database uh, determines which comment character we use, but the common ones are dash dash. And you can see how this is highlighted in green. Uh, the other one is actually going to be a pound, and this is for more MySQL and MariaSQL databases. 
Awesome. Now that we have an injection point, let's take a look at our game plan. So our SQL injection sequence, the first thing we want to do is find the number of columns in the original query. That's going to allow us to append additional queries to the end of that and allow us to select more data. Then from there, we're going to enumerate the database tables. We're going to enumerate the columns in the target tables, and then we're going to find and extract any useful information. So let's see how this is in practice. I'm going to go ahead and open up Burp, and I'm going to take a look at my web history. I can see we have the category pets. So I'm going to right click and send this to repeater. And pretty much every time I use Burp Repeater, I want to make sure that I get a baseline for what the query looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and just click send. And this is the regular 200 response that I received from the application. And for our case here, I'm actually going to set this to render. Awesome. So I can scroll down and see the lazy dog more than just a bird song. Uh, so this is filtered by pets. So let's go ahead and start with step one, where we want to enumerate the number of columns that are being requested by the database. So to do this, we're going to use the order by clause. So I see that this is a get parameter and everything is entered in here. So we're gonna start with a single apostrophe and then I'm gonna do space order by. Now order by allows us to sort by columns uh, we can also sort by the column index. So we can sort by the first column or the second column or the third column. So what this is gonna allow us to do is identify how many columns we have by allowing us to sort by that column index. And once we hit a point where the column index doesn't exist, we're gonna get an error. So we wanna try order by all the way up until the point we get an error. So I'm gonna start with order by one. And then as we showed earlier, we need to do our dash dash to comment out the rest of the information. And the last thing we need to do, because this is not proper HTML, is we need to convert this to, uh, we need to convert the, the special characters to URL format. So the shortcut for this is control U. I'm gonna show you how to find this in burp. And then I'm just gonna use control U moving forward. So I'm gonna go ahead, uh, convert the special characters. So we see the spaces have been replaced with a plus. And I'm gonna go ahead and click send. And scroll down, so we have pets order by. And we see that the information's been ordered. Um, oh, one thing before I forget. I know that this is SQL injectable, but if you wanna see if something is SQL injectable, you can try something like uh, or one equals one, dash dash. Uh, you want to be very careful when using or one equals one because if you're targeting a database that has say uh, 400 gigs of data in a table then what you would just request is all of the data in that table which would be 400 gigs and downloading 400 gigs of information uh, from an internet connection is going to or even just a general network connection honestly is going to crash the system or it's going to crash your system or your system crash their system or it might flood the network with traffic and that's bad. So instead, it's better to use some sort of limit. So I'm gonna use limit, uh, I'm gonna limit it by two queries. So again, I'm gonna highlight this and then control U to URL encode, click send. So here we can see it's not just showing pets anymore. Uh, we see information with shoes. And then we also see that it's limited to only two queries or two, uh, two elements at the same time. So that's how you can test if something is SQL injectable or not. And then from there, we start with our order by, and uh, that's where we left off. So let's continue. So I'm gonna set this to order by two. I'm gonna press control U to URL encode that. I'm gonna go ahead and click send. Uh, so this did not return an error. Let's try one more. So order by three. And I believe this is our first error, 500 internal server error. So what this tells us is that the original query is requesting exactly two items. Cool. So the next thing we want to figure out is uh, what kind of information can we pull from the database? So what kind of information or what kind of database is this? And then what kind of functions or built-in functions can we use to pull additional information to perform reconnaissance on our database? So I'm gonna jump back over to render. Uh, there we go, internal server error, awesome. 
So here we're going to do union select. Uh, now what a union select allows us to do is pad uh, queries to the end of existing data that's being returned. So to do that, we need to know exactly how many columns or how much information is being queried by the, um, by the SQL query. So in this case, we found out that it's two. So to get an idea, this is also a good practice of where information is being returned to the system. We can simply do uh, union select. And then we can just select the numbers one and two. Uh, in this case, it's going to throw us an error and you'll see why. So I'm gonna do control U and click send. We're gonna get another internal server error. So if you get this, it's possibly because you are returning an integer instead of what is expected, a string. So we can just go ahead and wrap these in single tick apostrophes in order to turn those integers into strings. And so this is going to run the query. I'll go ahead and wait for this to render. There we go. And so we can see one and two are being returned in the title and the description respectively. Awesome. Let's start asking for information from the database. So one of the first things we wanna know, uh, right, because we don't know what type of database we're dealing with, so we don't know what type of functions it will support. So we can simply type in version. This is very common in SQL. And then of course we need exactly two columns. So I'm just going to uh, clear out my column and call it null. So I'm gonna go ahead uh, do not forget to URL encode. This is very important. And then click send. And so we see a giant grasshopper. And here is our Postgres SQL 12.12. Uh, .12. So this is running on Ubuntu x86.64, and it was compiled by GCC. So we're dealing with a Postgres SQL database. Now, the reason why this is important is because a Postgres SQL database, uh, we can return the current database that we're working in, uh, or it's also known as a schema. So the function to do that with Postgres is called current schema. So instead of returning all of the pets information, I'm just gonna leave that as blank. I'm gonna maintain the union select version, and then I'm also going to add in uh, current schema. And so this is gonna tell us the database that we're operating in, which is very important for some of our introspection queries that we're gonna try in a moment. So I'm gonna go ahead and click send. Here is our version and our current schema is public. Awesome, so we can use that to filter things down. Uh, first, I'm gonna show you what it looks like to query for tables and why we wanna know what the schema is ahead of time. And then I'm gonna show you how to filter it based on that schema. So SQL injection databases have uh, various introspection queries. Introspection just means that we can ask questions about the database itself and not necessarily the data in the database. So uh, the easiest one is actually going to be information schema. So that is the schema or the database that stores all of the database information for all of the other databases. Uh, it's metadata information. So I'm gonna start from the top. I'm gonna to do apostrophe, uh, union, select, and then I'm going to do table name and table schema from information schema.tables. So this is gonna show us a lot of information and you'll see why it's important for us to know what the schema is ahead of time uh, because this can be a lot, a lot, a lot. Again, this is something you would normally want to set a limit on in this case, I'm not going to worry about it just because I want to show you how much information you can pull out and it's all metadata. So don't forget your URL encode. So I'm going to press control U and then I'm going to go ahead and run this. So here's our query and we can see uh, in the PG catalog, which is a, another metadata database, it has various different tables and names. Uh, I can scroll down for a while. Then we see information schema. Uh, which is the schema that we directly queried. Uh, eventually we'll come across our public schema, but it looks like we've ran out of room here. So this is why it's important to find out what your current schema is. So what we can do is run the same query, except in this case, we're going to add in a clause to kind of filter this down. So we're going to set where 
table underscore schema equals, and then we already know it's called public. So don't forget to do your URL encode. Click send. So this is going to return all of the table information. Uh, so we have two tables. We have products and we have users as part of the public schema. Cool. So on to step three, we have a target table. So let's take a look at users, but we need to know what the columns are in the users table. So this is going to be another job for information schema. But in this case, we're going to use a uh, table name and then we'll use column name from information schema dot columns. So information schema dot tables has all of the table information. Information schema dot columns has all of the column information for each table. So I'm going to go ahead and click send. And so this is going to show for products, we have category and name. For users, we have username. Uh, this is a little spread out and it shows more product information than I'm looking for. So instead of table schema, I'm going to change this to table name. I'm going to change this to users. So I'm going to go ahead and click send. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm just going to wait for this to return. And we're going to scroll down and we can see in the users table, we have a username and a password. Awesome. Now for the home stretch, let's go ahead and query that information and see what we can do with it. So since it's uh, nice and easy, it's only two columns and we need exactly two columns. This is perfect for us. So we're going to I'll just start over union select. Uh, I'm going to ask for username and password from users. This is the error I was talking about, why we need to URL encode every single time. So I like doing these things live. It gives me an opportunity to show you any of the mistakes that you might make and how to fix them. So right here, I just pressed Control U again to URL encode our information. I'm going to click Send again and scroll down. And so we have three users. We have Carlos, we have Administrator, and we have Wiener. Wiener? Wiener? I don't know. I'm going to say Wiener. So here is our administrator and our administrative password. So these look like they're in clear text, definitely not any sort of SHA hashing or bcrypt and definitely not MD5. So I'm just going to take this as a um, clear text parameter. So I'm going to go ahead and pretty print this. Let's grab it out of here. It wouldn't let me copy from render. So let's scroll down until we can see it. Here's administrator. Here is our password and we can hop back to the website and go to my account administrator and then I'm going to paste in the password and log in congratulations you solved the lab perfect I love seeing that Awesome. So what we just did was target an SQL injectable endpoint and convince the server to run our code. We did this by closing the initial string input with a single quote and extending the rest of the SQL statement. So first we had to test to make sure that it was injectable and we used or one equals one for that. After that, we followed our four step process, find the exact number of columns for our union attack, locate a target table, locate the columns that we're interested in, and then use that knowledge for complete data compromise. In this case, we stole credentials for the administrator account and logged in as them. I also wanna point out that some of the queries are database specific and depend on which database you're targeting. For example, MS SQL will have different functions for user or version and will have different introspection queries instead of information schema. So once you identify the underlying database, make sure you change your queries a bit from these examples. Now. As I said earlier, I highly recommend Portswigger Web Security Academy to practice finding and exploiting SQL injections. They have a number of SQL injection challenges to play around with. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm not going to cover all of them here. Instead, I'm going to let you struggle on your own to really build up that skill. But with everything we just went over today, you have plenty of information to go through and beat at least most of them on your own. 
For the blind SQL injection challenges, we will get to those in the next video. So make sure you subscribe and hit that bell to see when that drops. The second website where you can practice your SQL injection techniques is on OWASP Juice Shop. There is a Heroku version online already, so you don't need to set up anything. You can just go directly to the website and start owning. It is shared, so if you want your own instance, then there is also a Docker image you can download and run it locally. I have a link down below. I'm also not gonna spoil anything here either. I'm just gonna say that there are two SQL injection endpoints, and if you want any more hints than that, then you're gonna to have to go back to where I called out where you can usually find SQL injection endpoints. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. In this video, we dug into SQL injections, what they are and how to find them. We also went over the four-step process on how to take full advantage of an SQL injection, which allowed us to steal user credentials in our test site. Finally, I gave you two websites where you can practice your own SQL injection skills. Thanks for sticking around to the end. If you thought this video was helpful, or if you have other websites that you've used to practice and would like to share those, let us know in the comments down below. In the meantime, check out the description for resources that I used here, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.